Good evening. So it is right about seven o'clock on the dot and we are going to go ahead and get started. I want to say welcome to everyone. We've got quite a group signed up tonight. If everybody shows up, we should have about 77 folks um, on board. So I want to say I'm very excited that we're going to be sharing five secrets of successful sourdough brought to you by a very, very uh, in-depth knowledgeable panel. I'd like to introduce those who are involved in our workshop tonight. Uh, they've been very involved all along in getting us to this point of the workshop. Uh, first, Mary Lee Kopachi and Aaron Walsh, both of them are master food preservers with Cornell Cooperative Extension. Also, currently, uh, they are also board members for our local association here in Rensselaer County. Um, Ali Ramdeen, who also is a friend of Cooperative Extension, and she has been very involved all the way along in bringing these Back to Home Basics series to you. Um, she's going to be our guide tonight, and so we're very excited about that. And actually, Amy Holleran is our featured educator tonight, and um, we are happy to have her here as the author of The New Bread Basket and actually a local expert on local grains and using some of these native and ancient grains in bread. She's very well known, not just locally, uh, but quite a bit uh, across the country. So we're really appreciative to have Amy with us tonight. Um, so I also wanted to just mention those of you who this might be your first experience with Cooperative Extension, we actually are the arm of Cornell University, our land grant university here in New York State to help deliver knowledge and research to communities. And so our goal is through research and education, we help increase the quality of life of our residents. We do offer a quite a wide range of programs for um, folks across New York State. And this instance, I would just share that we have programming from field to your fork. And this is a perfect example of a workshop meeting that need. Um, so we do work with farmers. We also work with consumers and we help to bring those two together, which is actually a nice little springboard. One of our projects that we do here at Cooperative Extension is we work with the Rensselaer County um, Economic Development and Planning Office and uh, support Harvest Connection. So I just want to share a little bit about you, a uh, little bit with you about Harvest Connection, which is a website that helps connect farmers or consumers with farmers and local product. So I'm just going to spend just a few seconds sharing this with you. Uh, so you will hopefully learn this as a tool and we can um, Let's see if we could do this. Oh, I got something covering things up here. Slideshow from the beginning. Just bear with me. Here we go. So Harvest Connection, uh, you can see this is our website at the top, the www.harvestconnection uh, slash newyork.com. This actually is a platform for farmers to participate in uh, by sharing what they have on their farm uh, for consumers. And so we cover this footprint is Albany, Columbia, Green, Rensselaer, Saratoga, Schenectady, and Washington counties. Call it the Capital District. Um, we do have a few farms that just are over the edge in Warren County. We're not very uh, particular. We'll um, take just about any farmer who's interested and has a local product to share with consumers and add them to the Harvest Connection. So this is what it looks like when you land on our website. You'll see here um, in the lower left hand, it says, find me some, and there's a blank and a down arrow. So I clicked on for practical purposes because this is a regional location. We're known for our maple syrup, especially this time of year. I clicked honey and maple syrup. I then went over and it says located. There's three options when you hit that down button. You can say located at a farmer's market, located on the farm, or I'm not picky and I'm totally not picky. So that's what I selected. So then you hit go. And this is what it looked like when I'm using this as an example. So you can see all those bubbles um, on this map 
and roughly where they're located. And you can see that there's a very good number of farmers who have honey and maple available on our harvest connection. So then to narrow it down, I did input my zip code. And that's what I ended up with. And as luck would have it, we've got a farm on Harvest Connection that's right around the corner from my location in Johnsonville. So I'm gonna click and highlight that and it takes me to the Groveside Naturals Farm. So that is just one quick example. Um, as all of you are interested in sourdough and learning more about that, this helps bridge the fact that there is local product uh, available that can help you with your uh, projects in the kitchen and beyond. So just wanted to make note of that. Also, before we get started, any reference to brands or businesses are done so just for educational purposes. They are not an endorsement. And at this point, uh, we are going to go ahead and pass things over to actually Amy Holleran, and she's going to get us started on the ins and outs and the secrets of successful sourdough. And again, thanks for coming. Process. Um, there's, there's a sense that, uh, or I had a sense that it was a professional thing and that it would really take a lot of precision. I'm a very improvisational person. The pancake is my favorite thing to make because it's dinner in about five minutes. Uh, so it didn't really seem like the right thing for me. But a few years ago, my son had a science fair and uh, an 11 year old classmate of his started her starter and from supermarket flour and made bread and she had a whole display of it and I went home chagrined and thought this is crazy I can't believe I've been so I've been building up walls against this process if an 11 year old can engage with it then I certainly can try to do it myself I took a book off the shelf I found some starter in my fridge that someone had given me I found the the tiniest bit in the bottom away from the the strangeness that had grown on top I fed that sourdough using a book and I used some beautiful fresh flour and I had a magical perfect loaf the next day um, and it was really a beginner's luck that fed fed my curiosity about this and I've been um, falling in love with sourdough ever since and it's it's such a rewarding process this is my my jar that I keep my sourdough in um, I don't know how detailed the bubbles are so this just grew overnight and I like to keep it in a pretty jar because you always keep things in pretty jars I label it starter so nobody gets uh, any ideas about anything else um, and now this can sit there for a few days or a week and, and then I'll take out bits, feed those, and then they make their way into this dough. Um, so bread is always uh, uh, influenced by what's around us. And when we think about sourdough bread, we might think of the Dutch oven and uh, the no need method that a lot of people profess. I prefer pans. I don't like to deal with the real heat of those heavy pans. I don't want to burn myself again. I've got, I've got scars from baking. I don't need to prove it anymore. Um, and so I've developed a system to reflect my family's tastes, which is a sandwich loaf and um, adapt to what I have. This way I don't have to have the steam in the oven. I make a little bread hat. It's pretty simple. You can, uh, you can improvise your way through. Um, if you think about the breads of the world, there are places where flatbreads is, are what people eat. Flatbreads and griddles, that's, that's all there is. And that's because we are in a unique situation in America with having access to these huge kitchens, huge ovens, reliable heat source, um, and th that, that influences what we're gonna do. Flour is also a product of time and place and, and everything that's around us. Um, the flowers that are available to us through a supermarket reflect a centralized food system 
that began to develop really in, it's really hard to say where something began. The Erie Canal happened in 1817, it started. By 1825, when the whole canal went across the state, Rochester had a name of Flower City. The entire western part of New York was a wheat boom town um, or a series of wheat boom towns as people bought land and, and took advantage of this incredible thing. Wheat is gold. And to have the flatlands of Western New York available for milling, um, the incredible falls in Rochester ready for that. And then the transportation across New York State, that was our first, the first instance of flour getting really away from a, lo a local production. And you're, you know, so that's not to say Troy did not have milling through up to about 1910s or so, um, but it really began to shift west and all of wheat production marched west and, we, and got centralized in these plains areas. Milling centers followed, um, these farming centers and at different times of, of the 1800s, the milling centers moved around and that was really, you can, do a history lesson by looking at where the milling happened in terms of talking about things like the Erie Canal, um, the westward march, theft of lands, all kinds of expressions of how we worked are in our flour. And by 1900, the bulk of flour was getting milled elsewhere. Um, we were still baking bread at home for the most part. It wasn't until 1920 that bread started to become a majority factory produced. Um, but we, by, by 1900, the majority of our flour was coming from somewhere else. And our local flour splendor was, was fading away. Genesee flour was the name of flour that from New York state and there was still a little echo of fondness and nostalgia as that began to disappear from view, but really it, it got out of sight and out of mind until about 15, 20 years ago, as, um, which is much later in terms of local foods. You know, you think about local foods starting to get really popular as um, like the late 1980s and 90s, our Troy Farmer's Market the first year was the year 2000. But the, the um, flour is late to the game. We still don't have a flour vendor at the Troy Waterfront Farmer's Market. And that's normal for most, um, most situations because everything still happens largely elsewhere. Those amber waves of grain are not waving out our windows. They are waving elsewhere. But I'm so excited that it is coming back um, right near us. So the flowers that I bake my bread from are all farmer ground flour, which is out in Ithaca, New York. They're organic and stone ground. I'm gonna shift this a little bit so I can show you the flower. Oh, I can't, it's shining crazy. So, hey, Amy, I've yeah. got a question for you. So yeah. what what is the recipe that we're demoing? And I wanna hop into our first secret. So what, let's go over it. What's the, the recipe that we're going over? So the recipe is called communal bread and it's a recipe developed by a, another bread writer advocate, uh, my friend, Adrian Hale. She's in um, Portland, Oregon. And it is a loaf that is super simple for me to remember. It has, oh, pause. <laughs> This is real time bread making in action. I think one of the big lessons everyone's going to get from this is that it fits into your life. Yes. And they're not, they're not commanding things. Like I can come back to this. <laughs> I can get off the, uh, the flour train and back on the bread train. So the communal bread is a really super simple recipe. It's got a thousand grams of flour to 750 to 850 grams of water, a little bit of oil, 
some starter, and that's it. Salt. One of, so one of the things that we talked about when we were thinking about the secrets of sourdough, or what are these really big key moments? And the first one we thought about regarding the starter was that you don't have to panic and you just need to get to know your starter. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> right. It's um, what, what is it about getting to know your starter? Your starter is flour and water that's growing a culture that's growing off of elements on the grains. And you just need to get to know how it works and how it works in our lives. And Aaron and Mary Lee, we're gonna chime in and we're gonna have a little conversation now about how it does fit. So I'm gonna stop talking for a minute. Let's, Aaron. so one of the things that you brought up that I thought was so interesting was like the durability of starters. Yeah, so um, similar to Amy, when I first started sourdough baking, I like it was very intimidating, but I think for the opposite reason of Amy, whereas Amy says she's very, um, she improvises, I'm like, no, there are rules, they must be followed. And so I got my sourdough starter, I think I was like eight months pregnant with my second. And so then I'm I have a brand new baby and a two-year-old and I'm trying to stick to this like precise feeding schedule for my sourdough and then at some point it just got forgotten in the back of the fridge. Um, and that's when I kind of realized that, you know, there's all this information out there, which is wonderful information that dives into the science of it. But you have to remember that like, I mean, people, sourdough has been, stars have been around for millennia. People have carried these things across continents and oceans. They don't need to be coddled and, you know, treated like a little baby. They'll, they'll be okay if you, um, you know, add a little too much water one time or forget about it for a month or two or <laughs> um, more. Um, that's not to say you shouldn't keep good care of your sourdough and learn all the science, but I think it there is so much information out there that it can prevent people from starting. So just, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, dive right into it and don't worry too much about messing it up. It's, it's really hard to mess it up. <laughs> like it's flour and water, it's very simple. <laughs> And that does remind me, I think, Ollie, you gave me some starter months ago. It has been in the, I used it a few times. It's been in the back of the refrigerator forever since, and I mean, many months. And Erin, you gave me the encouragement. You said, just go in and just start scooping out a couple of tablespoons and mix it up with some water and flour, certain amounts. And I did go buy the grams. I tried that because I'm more of a tendency towards uh, not as restrictive, you know, or exacting, you know, so, and it came out great. Actually, it bubbled up and it looked terrible. Actually, I'll show you something. Uh, it looks like it, there's just um, old water at the top and it's almost gray, if everybody can see that. So that, you know, you can end up quite a bit of the fermented flour left and there's a lot of good recipes for that, which I'll get into later, but it is amazing how you can just take a couple of tablespoons and it starts reviving a little feeding at a time. So. It's, it is resilient. Okay, Very so Amy, much so. Yeah. Do you want to walk us through some of the practice and the process of making the sourdough? Yes, I do. So the the way that I approach my my bread is I will take a little bit out. You start with the starter, um, and the next uh, you just take out say a tablespoon of the starter and mix it with equal parts water and flour. I feed that when I'm going to bed. And at the same time, I will mix my flour and water. Because I'm using whole grain flours, they, that bran really needs some time to sit with the, the liquids. And so the bran is going to relax a bit if it's got a really long time to have contact and hydrate. So the same time I start my starter, eight to 10 hours before I'm gonna make, mix my, my whole dough, I'll mix together the liquids and the flour. So the flour will, um, it will be the thousand grams. And I like to use a mix of different um, 
flowers. I use high, a high extraction flour and that means that it has some of it sifted out, some of the bran sifted out and it looks very much like white flour. Um, then I'll use a whole wheat flour, which has the bran pieces in it. And I'll also use rye. And the combo of all of these make a really um, robust grain dough, but it still rises and comes together. The, the secret that I wanna share about that is that the process is the secret and the familiarity that you can gain over time, like any relationship with your starter, with your recipe is gonna get you practicing everything better. And the more familiar you are with a recipe and sourdough, you'll, you'll, you'll ease your way into it. So I wanna encourage you to as you begin with sourdough, stick to one recipe. There's, there's, um, I remember a carryover I had from yeasted bread dough baking where I wanted to try lots of recipes with sourdough, but really if you get to know the way one dough behaves and then you can play with the variables like the flour or the time, and you will get to know how it's gonna function in your life, but give it some room to, to grow with you and just get to know it. Um, toward that, another secret of, of this is that time is going to be the muscle. Um, I'd like to share my screen and I think that, I think I'll be able to do that. I'm gonna show you how I mix it. I videoed it already. And I'm just gonna talk over it. Theoretically, I will. So. You can refresh, Amy, it should reload. Okay, great. And we're gonna turn off I think it's this one. Nope, it's this one. Okay. And full screen and I have to find the mute so you don't hear NPR. There you go. So I just use tap water when I'm making my bread. I um, do let it dechlorinate. I just have big big uh, jugs that I let the water sit on the counter. I use a little bit of olive oil. You can also use butter. That's 20 grams of olive oil. I'm using a scale as you can see because I just, it's much easier to get accurate measurement with bread than um, trying to measure into cups. It's a small investment to, to get your scale. You know, about $20 will get you a, a pretty reasonable scale. And um, then you can rest assured that you're not measuring incorrectly. Flour is really easy with how, you see how when I scoop it, it can get compressed. When you're weighing by volume, which baking really is, then you're, you're going to have a lot more flexibility um, and you can relax more once you have a scale. So right there, I'm going for my 400 grams of high extraction or white flour, um, white-ish flour, it's not a real white flour, 400 grams of the stone ground rye and stone ground wheat. No, I said that wrong. 200 grams of stone ground rye and 200 gram, 400 grams of stone ground wheat. Um, and I use a stand mixer. A lot of my baking friends and friend baking instructors will say it's really important to get your hands in the dough. And it is a beautiful tactile experience. However, I have I don't have very good uh, forearms because I gave it all to the book. And so I need to conserve my my energy and my trusty KitchenAid um, 
does the mixing. So right there is where I'm letting the, all the bran and the, and the liquids get to know each other. So this part is really crucial when you're doing any kind of whole grain baking. And when you're working with these local flours, it's generally gonna be whole grain baking. Um, even if some of it is sifted off in a higher extraction flour. So that is what I will let sit while I'm letting the starter grow. Um, and then I'm going and to, yes? How much water was that, Amy? We have a question from Ashley. How much water was that that you added? That's 800 grams of water. Yeah, and then I just cover it with a plate. That's um, one thing that drives me nuts. And there is some already hydrated flour with its mixer attachment in it. Um, there's the starter going in. So the scale allows me to just weigh out my 50 grams of starter and I will add my, um, I add a tablespoon of salt. I don't bother to weigh the salt because when it gets down that low, the scale is not as accurate. Um, but so a tablespoon works really well for measuring salt and a tablespoon of salt is what fits this bread dough. Bread doughs generally have about 2% salt and um, so when you add up all the other ingredients that's where it is. I use a sea salt um, that it comes from Utah. You can use any salt you want uh, that's not as um, you know I, I'm not as particular about the salt as I am about the flour. I really think there's a lot of nutrition to be gained from a stone ground whole grain flour. Um, and a lot of community nutrition in terms of having a small local mill that puts agriculture and agricultural jobs back in our communities. Um, and I just love the flavor. You are working with something that has bran and um, bran and germ in it, and that's where the flavor essence is. White flour, you might think of as just um, something that, that you're adding flavor to, but you are working with something that is fresh as produce, really. It lasts about six months once it's milled. Not all your produce is gonna last six months, but it's, I'm making a stretch. Um, and then you, uh, you, know, you, you have this really great product. What I'm showing you here is I, I mix this all together and maybe I'll let it go two or three minutes. Here it's nice, it's coming away from the side of the bowl. Uh, so that is, you can let it go a little bit longer, but that's pretty much it. I'm not looking to mix it an awful lot because time is going to do the, the building of the gluten strands. Mm -hmm. Um, these things are going to get busy together with the starter that's now incorporated. It's going to sit on the counter or in a big tub like this um, for... Oh, your still running, Amy. What's that? Your video is still running. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I want to show you everything, everything all at once. Um, and then, you know then it's ready for the shaping after it's had eight hours or so on the counter. It might be a little bit shorter depending on um, the, the temperature. So these breads, as they sat on the counter, they were a good eight hours before they were ready to shape, maybe, maybe seven. Uh, but the dough that I mixed today, which has some squash in it, that, uh, that moved much more quickly because it has the sugar. And let's see, stop sharing there. So this dough moved much more quickly. And um, I can, whenever we're ready to show some shaping, I can do that. We have a quick question before we move on. There was a question about where you get your flour from in Ithaca. So I don't have to go to Ithaca. Um, they sell, they, they stock at the Honest Weight Food Co-op. Farmer ground flour is in the bulk bins there and you can get 
their 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 flower there. I also get flour from a mill called Sparrow Bush Bakery, and that's just in Hudson. Um, and you can order online and pick it up down at farmers at the Hudson Farmers Markets on Saturday. and it's really fun to get all these local flowers. Farabush Bakery, yep. And um, it's it's a great, great way to access it. Yeah. So practice is the memo. Practice, practice, practice in a fun way. Your family is going to love it. Um, let time do the work. Take it easy. You know, time is really the muscle that's going to make the bread. That's... Uh, if you saw that it wasn't very long that it was um, on the mixer. I don't do any kneading. You know, some people really like kneading and um, there's a lot of different ways to approach it, but really you, um, you don't have to, you can let things sit and this is essentially a no need dough. Yeah. Um, I just saw a question about how do you make the starter? And the best way to make the starter is to get starter from a friend because there's there, there were a friend of mine, um, a baker friend did a project last year called the Quarantiny Sourdough Project. And he walked people through, Andrew Janjigian uh, used to work for um, Cook's Illustrated and he did everyone, um, he helped, walked people through this starter, but boy, that, that can be weeks, should be weeks to build your own starter. But I have extra starter right here. And we have a secret about starter later on that we, um, we will talk about, but it's re I really don't think there's much, um, I think that the magic is getting to know the bread process rather than getting to know the sourdough making process. Sourdough will grow from the cultures on the ground grains. So that's why it's just flour and water, but you don't need to be um, making that magic. Your magic and time and love can go into making the bread. Yeah. Um, our, next, our next part, is that, uh, you know, back to what Aaron was talking about and thinking about how you have to feed the starter very, very methodically and at precise times, um, there's, there's a little bit of an idea that you have to be married to the bowl or married to your sourdough bucket and everything is determined by that. But in reality, this stuff works around your life as well. Um, and one way that that one strategy that we have to help sourdough fit into your life is the refrigerator. Erin, do you want to talk about using the refrigerator and temperature to help uh, control where the dough is going? Yeah, so um, a lot of times, you know, you just want to leave the dough, the sourdough out, like either at room temperature or somewhere slightly warm. Um, you know, this time of year next to a stove, I usually like to think of wherever my cat snap, that's a good warm place. But sometimes, you know, then it's rising and then you're like, ah, like I didn't time this right. You know, I'm not going to have time to finish this before I have to go to bed or, you know, something else came up. So you put it someplace cool and that's going to mm -hmm. slow it down. So the refrigerator is a great place to put your dough on hold. Um, either during the first rise or after you've shaped it during the second rise. And actually with the longer ferments, um, because it'll continue to rise in there, it's just going to slow down. You're not going to stop it completely. Um, while that fermentation is happening, you're going to actually get some more flavor. So I think some people choose to, you know, proof and rise the dough in their refrigerator as a matter of course to get that extra flavor. But it is Extra a good little trick to have. And the nutrition too, Erin. Some mm -hmm. people really feel that, um, and there is some scientific research on it, but not, not a uh, overwhelming tidal wave yet, that sourdough is more digestible. Um, and that's 
That's a whole bunny hole that I am not going to get into now, but basically it's related to the fact that we are eating seeds and seeds, that's not their first job to feed us. They want to make another plant. So working with um, sourdough and soaking can help us digest a little bit better. Mary oh. Lee, do you have... Yeah, I did a little experiment this afternoon because I had that situation happen a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and that was, I put the, I was raised, I was setting the dough to rise and it was growing very quickly, but I had to be elsewhere. So I said, I'm going to put it in the refrigerator. I think it was two in the morning. I was making a quilt actually. And I said, okay, I can't do this anymore. This is going in the fridge. And then the next day we were having to meet up with someone and uh, could not bake it that day. There's no way. So I left it in the refrigerator. So the following morning, a day and a half later, it did rise and it went back down. And I thought, what am I going to do? Because of the value of the food and I was looking forward to it. So what I did was decide to um, add commercial yeast, you know, active dry yeast, add a little warm water, made a little bit of a slurry, had this dough that was ready to, you know, go into the oven, but it was, I spread it out and worked it in, put it back together um, and shaped it into mounds. It did start raising, but to give myself a guarantee of that I would want to eat it no matter what it tastes <laughs> like, I started adding, I decided, okay, I had some ras dried raspberries, some dried pecans, and actually that was one loaf. And another one was uh, shredded um, cheese with dried um, uh, basil. Mm. And it really came out well, really did it. It rose enough, it was acceptable. This is actually the, um, uh, the one I took it out with the refrigerator. Um, this is actually the uh, Parmesan, mm. uh, excuse me, not Parmesan, cheddar with uh, basil. So actually I was really pleased with the bread and it gave me a little courage to say, okay, I'm gonna have to make, some, make something else happen with this just in case, but it came out great. So I felt like I problem solved a little bit, did a little problem, uh, troubleshooting, I mean. And to make a note on Aaron's comment about the temperatures, I did a little experiment this afternoon. It's called my three pints experiment. So this is what I did. I, made, I fed the same dough, the same starter, took it out of the refrigerator, fed it and divided it into equal amounts and fed it equally. And then I put it at, I think it was noon today, put one package, can you see that pretty well? One pint in the refriger refrigerator, one I left on the counter, and one I put by the wood stove. <laughs> and the elastic uh, is where it started. So that's a great uh, suggestion. Someone had taught me that to see, and you can gauge how much. So at four o'clock I checked. Now this is the one from the refrigerator. At four o'clock, I don't know if you can see that line, but at the top up here. So it went just from the, the rubber band up. This is the one from the fridge, the one from the uh, countertop, warmer temperature, right? When that, that's the difference right here. And then the one by the wood stove went, I expected it to go a lot higher, but it actually didn't. It, it wasn't too close to the wood stove, so I was cautious. But you can see it was a little bit more than the other one. And then since then, which is four o'clock. I've just, um, I left them in there till about an hour ago. So you can see the temperature does affect uh, the rise on that. So that kind of helped me gauge when would I use the starter because I wasn't quite figuring that out. When is it what you might call ripe or, ripe or prime? So if you would speak on that, that would be helpful. Yeah, yeah. So it's, that's, a, that's a great question. And I was trying to get my starter for what I mixed here ready so that I could tell us all at this, show you it growing. Um, and if I were smart, I would have taken a picture. I think I have a picture of it growing. No, I don't. Part way. The rubber band is a great sense because then you can see when it's grown and you want your starter to about double in volume before before it's ready to use it but that said don't don't be uh, you know attached to that that exact time if it's a little less or a little more 
I still use it because I'm not going to be selling my bread to anyone except my kid. I need him to eat. And uh, he's, he's very happy in general to eat what I make as long as it's not too sour. Um, and so there's, it's, it's, I love your exercise, Mary Lee, because it shows you how temperature does influence the dough coming, the starter coming along. And, um, are you, sh are you trying to show another thing? Well, Mary Lee? so I did take some of this. I had some extra and I think I just took the one on the counter and I made, I mixed up the bread probably at about four o'clock or maybe five o'clock. So you can see it start, I just, you know, it needs more, I think it needs more uh, time, wouldn't you say? Amy? Yeah. Would you say it yep, needs more it's, time? But it's this starting. Is it, this is just the first rate, you know, first rise for an hour. Yep. So, yeah. So, so, and it smells That's, incredible. I have two starters. One is super tangy. The other one is milder, but tangy, but one yeah. stands out. And that's a good time to note that, um, so your starters are white flour, Mary Lee? Uh, or? I, I've been adding uh, whole wheat. Whole wheat. Yeah. So mine is always rye. I just always use a rye flour starter. And, oh, this is the way you really tell if it's ready to float. And this is why it's not oh, on the top of mine for me, because I'm always using a rye starter. And this trick that I'm going to tell you about doesn't work for rye. Rye doesn't pass the float test. You can take a piece of your um, right of your sourdough, put it in water, and if it floats at the top, then it's ready to give the strength to your dough. Rye does not have the same type of gluten, so it won't hold the structure and and float in the water. That doesn't mean that it's not going to rise. But let's see. Yeah. All right. We're going to call you on this one now. I think so that's great. What, what would you suggest? Which one? I want the, I want the, I'll take the one on the right. My right? <laughs> uh, no, the other right. My right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's see. Because I think that's really good to know because that's how you can figure things out for yourself instead of being tight with circumstances that change for you. So let's see. So you're suggesting I take some of this out? Yep. Just take a little bit out. Not Okay. See how that's nice and stretchy. Yep. As it came that. free. Mm -hmm. I know and now gonna... let's put it in the water and see what will happen. But before it has a dollop on my computer keyboard. <laughs> can you, I don't know if you can see it. I, can, I got a reflection going. So can you see the glass? Yeah. You can even right. pull it away a little bit. All right. I'm trying. Oh, there. Ooh, the moment. Ooh, Ooh. It's ready. Give let's it make some expert. bread. Good job. Look at that. That's um, a good test to know. Thank you. Perfect. Well, it's a great test, you know, to build your confidence because familiarity is the so, real, um, to the real teacher, right? Yep. Practice is your teacher. And it. now, you know, the other things you were talking about, Mary Lee, over the weekend, when you added, you took your, you followed your instinct and added a little bit of yeast. That's a great thing to do. This stuff does, shouldn't go to waste. It's great food. Another strategy you can use if you feel like it's gone too long and life got away with you, you've got tortillas. You've got incredible, you know, maybe add a little bit more flour, break it into golf ball size pieces, roll it out and just cook it right on the griddle. Or you can turn that into an Indian bread and stuff it with some potato or spices and um, dip it in yogurt. You've got, this stuff is endless or it's pizza. It doesn't have to be, you know, the best pizza crust in the world. You have an ingredient and it's there to use it. Good idea. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. And you can dehydrate it. Yes, absolutely. This is the way, um, that's another way that you can get starter is from dehydrated pieces and then rehydrate it at home. Um, and I'll say, Amy, I'll interject in the handout that everyone will receive after this, I put a link to King Arthur has a great blog post about how if you want to put your starter on hold and um, dehydrate it, I put a link to that in the, um, in the handout that everyone will get. That's great. Should we um, shape some dough? Do we want to see that? Sure. 
I think, well, let's let's head over to yeah. the part. So the dough goes in the oven. Show us a little bit about that and then talk about knowing when it's done. Yeah. Well, that has, oh, wow. There's still 15 minutes in there. Can we show the shaping of the dough and then I can actually show? Totally. Yeah. And then there somewhere, Mary Lee, too, I want to make sure that we talk about um, what to do with the excess fermented flour. Mm -hmm. Yes. And we can even simultaneously talk about um, excess fermented flour, because I think that that goes nicely with what we were just talking about in terms of, you know, salvaging a dough. There's, okay, there's my board. So fermented flour is an ingredient that you can add to cookies and things like that. Mary Lee, do you want to talk about that while I'm shaping? Because I don't think... Uh, yeah. Sure, I because I need to say much while I'm doing this. Yeah, absolutely, because it's an, you get pretty enthusiastic when you're coming back to the sourdough stuff. So little having little, then you see a little more is better and better, of course, right? So you do end up, as I showed you earlier, a little bit of uh, fermented flour, um, the excess, and I could take this and make a thousand starter con <laughs> containers, right, Erin? I could take a little bit of this and start feeding it, but I'm, you know, I was ready to start using it. So I um, found uh, some recipes and we all know that some of the best simple, you know, best recipes are the easiest quite often because you're just focusing on the ingredients. And um, you can certainly make pancakes, uh, you can make cookies, you can make uh, all sorts of muffins there as, as uh, Amy was saying. So what I chose to do was make crackers because I like to store food. I'm a master food preserver. I really like the idea of long-term storage. I don't have to go back out to the store. Food's there when I want it. So I made um, some fennel crackers and I can get this open, maybe not. Um, and it was just with the discard and the recipe is on the PDF that's coming out. And it's, it's simply a uh, flour. Let me show you what it that's actually, it smells incredible because it has fennel, garlic in it, and um, it's simply flour and the sourdough, you know, the fermented flour, uh, and then regular flour. And, and then these, I added some uh, cornmeal because that was one of the options. Uh, and then butter or olive oil, I put butter in, and salt, and then fresh herbs. So I checked my pantry and I said, okay, I have a lot of fennel, I'd like to use that. So I actually used, uh, fennel and um, a little bit of garlic. And I use garlic powder. I usually use the fresh, but that's what I had available. So, and I made them into different shapes. So as you can see, I cut them out and just made them with this pizza cutter. I didn't have parchment paper, so I had to roll it on the uh, board. And when I did that, um, it kind of misshaped. And then when I put the spatula underneath, no matter how thin the spatula was or how much flour I did, but they're so delicious. I can smell the herbs and the sourdough right now. And another way to do it is to do it with um, just breaking them. And I really like that kind of rustic look. So with that and cheese and then apples from storage, you can have healthy, great foods uh, really easily. And if you like to preserve some foods, um, you know, these are marinated peppers, went well with it. And as a matter of fact, um, my husband and I had some of these last night and we actually had one or two pieces of jerky that we had made. We learned to make a few months ago. And so we had beef jerky and it worked out just like you would with salami or something you might want on that besides. And it was phenomenally tender and delicious. And next week, uh, one of the master food preservers is going to make teach us how to make jerky at home, the most amazing uh, varieties of jerky. So it is great that you can have this food available and it's just from the fermented flour. So that's what I did. That's great. I love cracker and to have homemade crackers, what a gift, you know, to yourself because well, you can really control what's in it and you can control the amount of fat, you control the flavors and get some of your garden in. And also it ships easily. You mm. can just mail it and a package of the crackers is a great gift with, you know, a couple of bits of tea, you know, tea, tea bags or something. Uh, it is a great gift though. So. That's great. Yeah. Thanks for- Yeah, you guys are not here. I know. <laughs>
So this is oh, my beautiful. method of shaping is I, um, I like to make little balls because I'm still kind of afraid of shaping. Um, and this is the only way I have to control it. Um, and I say that so that you can feel comfortable to keep on having fears and working with them and around them. Um, there's always, there's always a way and there's, there's so many ways to shape dough. You could watch shaping videos all day and um, I'm certainly not much of an expert on it, but you're kind of, what you're doing is you're creating a skin for that, all that, that yeast activity to happen. Um, so I'm trying to make a little skin around my ball of dough and I'm kind of sliding it across. I'm using water instead of flour. That's a, a pretty big habit with sourdoughs because um, number one, we, well, with whole grain sourdoughs especially because they're a higher hydration. So it would absorb a lot of flour if I were using flour to shape stuff. Using water, it, the extra water is not hurting it at all. It's maybe helping things along because that bran is still a little bit thirsty. And um, lost my train of thought. Anybody take it? Uh, but this about the water and the thirstiness of the, the water and the salt. thirstiness. I went somewhere else. Yep. Anyway, all this to say you're still going to get bread. And there we go. We have two little, you could make it into several smaller ones and then have kind of like a pull apart bread. Um, it's a really fun way to do it. And um, I, right now I've got more dough than I do pans. So one strategy is I could put that in the refrigerator and shape it tomorrow. But I'm just saying that because I want you to look at this as something that uh, you are in charge of, and it's not in charge of you. You guys are working together, really. It's a real relationship, like any um, any good kitchen project. And, hmm? did you have a question, Mary Lee? Oh, I actually saw one of the questions on the um, site, and it, it related to looking for a starter locally. I, yep. think, um, I think Catherine... Carly mentioned that locally you can get, um, a bakery will often uh, be willing to share or sell you some of their starter because people were starting to ask. And thank you, Catherine, for <laughs> pointing that out. It's great to know, I didn't know that. Catherine from Seattle. Yep. Yeah. So that's, um, the bread is still cooking. So we have another great thing to talk about, and that's Catherine's project. Um, Catherine, I'm so excited you're here with us tonight, and we get to talk about uh, your community loaves thing. So let's dive in. So it's my pleasure, actually, um, uh, to introduce, actually, Catherine Curley, who signed on. She got stuck in traffic in the Seattle area and signed on a little late, so wasn't part of our initial um, uh, introductions, I would say. Uh, but I am going to share a little piece uh, that's also going to help frame why we invited Catherine to be with us. Um, Catherine actually is uh, an administrator with a culinary school in the Seattle area but she also is a leader uh, in her community of home bakers. And their passion for bread and their community has really taken off. And I'm just gonna share this little snippet um, and then you guys can definitely have opportunity to ask Catherine questions and Catherine can actually expand a little bit on what you're going to see shortly. behind Community Loaves, a special project to donate home-baked bread to local food banks in Seattle. 
500 home bakers is led by Catherine Curley, a college administrator and avid home baker who has transformed her garage to function as a hub for a twice monthly bread collection. Bread's been around for a long time. It's four simple ingredients, flour, water, salt, yeast. And each time someone discovers it for the first time, it's like magic. What started out as a 19 loaf donation at the start of the pandemic has grown to a recent donation of more than 1,300 loaves. Car loads of bread are collected and donated to Hopelink, an area food bank that has seen a surging demand during the pandemic. Matthew Campbell is their associate director of food programs. When I think of my childhood, my baba, my grandma used to make the best homemade bread. That reminds me of this. You can see smiles through masks. You still can. You can see the eyes go up. 600, 700 loaves of bread going out there. That's 600, 700 smiles. And that's just awesome. It makes a difference. If I divide this up. Catherine and some of her original group of bakers developed the formula for their honey oat loaf bread, including local flour that's sourced from wheat grown in Washington State. A batch is four. And we want them to donate three. And we encourage them to keep one. We feed them and thank them for their time, while at the same time paying it forward through the gift of the bread. He's 76 years old. Did he try it? Yeah, he loves it. For Sarah Ganholm, being a part of Community Loaves has allowed her to connect with her elderly father during the pandemic. He's never made anything but chocolate chip cookies in his oven or his room. It just seemed like a natural thing for us to get on Zoom together and do this together. My dad now has bread, and now he's really proud of this new skill, and all of a sudden he's giving back to the community in a way that he's never done in his life. This dough already has a lot of development. Catherine didn't start baking bread until later in life, but she has fond childhood memories of watching her grandma Ruth bake bread and desserts. Sadly, her grandma, Ruth Weissen, passed away in August at the age of 105. So when I visited her this summer, this project was going, and she wasn't eating very much, but she would eat bread. And she said to me that if the project had existed when she was baking bread, that she would have loved to participate. For Thanksgiving last year, Community Loaves adapted their bread recipe to make special dinner rolls, and then they topped off 2020 with a bang, donating almost 4,000 pecan finger cookies for the winter holiday season, a favorite recipe of Catherine's grandma, Ruth. As for 2021, Catherine's greatest hope is that other cities can find a way to copy what Community Loaves has been doing in Seattle. It's restored my faith in the collective good that we can actually do. We can be more self-determinant even in the face of uh, the pandemic. Nice job. Nice job. Oh. So I have to say that I'm um, particularly um, proud and pleased and happy to turn things over to Catherine Curley. That gives you a snippet of all that she's accomplished in her community. And I hope that that actually might be a little bit of a catalyst to get everybody who might be thinking about how much they love to make bread or other items and how they can give back uh, to their community. And so I'm going to just fiddle with my settings here. Uh, bear with me here, Catherine. And I'm just gonna pass it over to Catherine. How'd we do? We are there. We are we live? You are live. Welcome. Welcome everybody on the East Coast. You must be cold. You don't look mm -hmm. cold. You've got power and uh, heat, I hope. You got, we got lucky. We got lucky for this storm. <laughs> yeah, and all we're getting is just rain, just deluged with rain. Um, yeah. It's not as pretty as the snow, but sometimes uh, you can get too much of it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm thrilled that you asked uh, me to come and hear, and Amy, it was, it's been such a treat. I didn't really miss much, but just the first couple of minutes. So it's been just a lovely treat to hear all of the... the um, efforts on uh, sourdough. I'm a huge fan of sourdough and local flour, supporting the local grain economy. And our project, Community Loaves, attempts to highlight 
and um, those uh, three specific aspects. One, that we are supporting the local grain economy by um, working with local mills and farmers to, uh, for the source of our flour. Um, two, that we're supporting bakers who um, want to work with sourdough and create uh, beautiful loaves and our instruction and coaching goes beyond just the community loaf. I have one here that I made yesterday. This is our new, uh, our new label, which you can't really see, nice. but you can see our people and our bread. Um, so, um, and then we have the recipient. Food is, um, baking is aromatherapy for the home. It's therapy for the heart. It's nourishing. It's what we give. And in this time, it is, um, a privilege when you can do something and um, give into a community that is suffering. Um, to date, we have donated 11,200 loaves of bread. Wow. We have a volunteer army of bakers of 611. We are um, geographically organized into 36 hubs, including Portland and Eugene. Oh, wow. uh, we wow. are gradually adding more uh, cities and states as we go, and every time we're working with, wherever possible, um, local flowers. So this was a test loaf yesterday for me. I do my batches in about eight, and um, this was Camas Country out of Portland. So we're adapting our formulas in order to um, use that um, that flower and uh, you know, playing with the with the combination. Our flowers are all whole grain or high extraction. They're both 50-50 and our loaves have oatmeal in them to up that um, whole grain um, quality. You do not have to be a sourdough baker in order to participate. We have three formulas. We are, um, what I call it, um, we're politically correct. We are um, leaven friendly. It doesn't, your choice. It can be um, sourdough or it can be yeast or the classic formula is a little bit of both. So um, that's just a little bit about what we're doing. I'd like to see us donate 30,000 loaves this year. And my personal, um, uh, today was a red letter day for me. Uh, we started our flower pop-up truck. I buy, uh, on behalf of the community loaves, we purchasing now 5,000 pounds of flour, wow. which is um, pretty cool. And uh, today was my first day in our flower truck, which we just rent for the week. And we visit the hubs. Prior to that, they all came, as you saw in the Today Show yeah. video, they come to my, they'd come to my garage to get their flour. But now we take it out to the oh. hubs in four day circuit once a month. So um, we, the bakers love that, that they're using really great flour, um, the kind that Tartine is using. And um, here we have a beautiful bakery called um, Sea Wolf and Grand Central, and they are using these, you know, these professional bakers. So having access to the good stuff is um, really fun and it performs differently and it tastes differently and it really kind of ups your bread game. And um, that's all, that's what we're doing. So I probably blabbered too much, but that's what we're doing here. No, I think that's awesome. So I do have like one, a couple specific questions for you, Catherine, regarding your project. And then I think we're gonna transition to all the wonderful questions in the chat. Um, but Catherine, what is the shelf life of your bread um, in terms of once it's cooked in your army's kitchens and delivered to pantries, what's the turnaround that they need to have um, to keep that bread intact in the way that you want people to experience it? Yeah, good. It's a good question. Um, we've really not put it to the full test. Uh, the only tests are um, our countertop tests at home. Okay. So six, seven days later, these loaves are still eating um, in large part because of that sourdough component. That sourdough serves as a natural preservative, which is lovely. Mm -hmm. But we do have the fully yeasted recipe as well. And a fully yeasted recipe is still lasting. And I'm, um, it's getting its 
preservation power from the addition of honey and the olive oil that is in the that is in the loaf. So that's giving it a little extra shelf stability. In general, our bakers bake on Saturday. They donate on Sunday and it's in the pantry on Monday. Okay. And it's in somebody's cart in somebody's box, somebody's hands, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and it's still edible. If um, really, really edible, like delicious, still yes. edible. Mm -hmm. um, if a baker, talking about fitting all lifestyles, if a baker can't bake on Saturday, uh, we encourage them to bake when it works for them and then to freeze the loaves. They freeze beautifully okay. and then they take them out and we donate them frozen. Wonderful. In fact, at the food pantry, they often will get loaves of bread, and if they can't get them out, they will put them into the walk-in coolers. Perfect. Now, yeah. do you send them out for distribution already uh, sliced, or no, they're whole? No, sadly not. But if we were if we were working a communal kitchen. Yep. then one of the investments I would make would be a slicer because it just adds yet one more layer of approachability for those patrons. But most of us in our homes do not have a slicer. Okay. So yeah. they, go, they go like this. Okay. All right. Perfect. Last little pesky question regarding your project. How did you convince your food uh, hubs to take product that's not done in a commercial kitchen? Well, first in Washington and in Oregon, uh, Washington state allows mm -hmm. the public health, Department of Health says that donations from home kitchens, as long as the item is not perishable, baked goods that do not require refrigeration is the specific copy. Right. Further, my relationship with our public health superintendent as a result of the school, because we have to be licensed all the time, right. uh, he just redoubled down on it and said, absolutely, this is no problem. Okay. Now, that is one thing. So by state law and in Oregon, by state law, that's fine. But in a time of COVID and in a time of food banks um, needing to be really um, careful, even maybe not being COVID related, yep. food banks often have a policy against taking items right. from homes. And right. so one of the ways that we have, I think, provided um, comfortability to the food banks is through our organization and our training. Mm -hmm. Because you are having to agree to a set of safety protocols and um, guidelines, you don't have to have a food handler's permit, but you're coming in, being trained, you're, uh, everything has to be labeled, has to have the ingredients on it. Okay. Uh, and and uh, most food banks just don't want, here's my grandma's banana bread, here's our pumpernickel, here's the chocolate chip cookies, here's this. They don't really have a way of dealing with that kind of situation. We've, we've created an army, the hubs bring it in, and then the hubs take an aggregated amount of bread to the bank. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much, fantastic. All right, and with that, I think maybe we should transition. I do want to remind everybody that this is being recorded. So um, <laughs> if you miss snippets of it, actually, I'm going to be honest with you, I forgot to hit record right in the beginning. So there might be a few things we have to doctor in the beginning. But you all will get a notification when this um, webinar is available on our YouTube channel for CCE. Um, but there are loads of questions. Um, I... I also have a little quick announcement, and I'm going to watch my panelists' faces first. Should I let the cat out of the bag with some of these secret things that are coming uh, for those who might be within driving distance to Troy? I think so. So there's lots of questions regarding starter. Yeah. So Aaron Walsh has graciously put together small little doses of starter that we will have available starting Sunday, no, Thursday morning uh, at the CCE office there in Troy. So what I'm gonna ask folks to do in the chat is to put your name, first and last name, 
If you are able and interested in receiving one of these um, reinforcement tools from the workshop, um, and you just need to show up to the CCE office between um, 8.30 and roughly four o'clock every, you know, in the, in the time frame, gonna have a week to pick it up from this Thursday to next Thursday. So put in the chat your name, first and last, and we'll make sure we have that available to you to distribute. Um, we do have some COVID-19 um, uh, limitations with our office. So we will, uh, there's uh, doors are locked uh, in the front because of our USDA office on, on the first floor, but there's a phone number that gets you upstairs. We'll come right down to the door, give you your little uh, sourdough starter uh, gift pet and you'll be on your way. So that is, that was the big secret coming out. Now, I think we need to kind of backtrack to some of these questions and any of the panelists from Catherine, Amy, Aaron, Mary Lee, Ollie, any of you, let's go ahead and tackle some of those questions. Bernie, can you just share the address of the CC offices? I sure can, I'll put it in the chat. So Amy, we have one last step that you're gonna cover and then maybe we can get into the questions. Yeah, you wanna talk about Hey, Felix, bring me that bread. Um, he's already taken it out of the pan, but we want to talk about telling when the bread is done. So this bread, I always keep my thermometer right by the stove. Oh, nurse, can I have the thermometer, please? And um, I'll poke it. I know generally how much time on the size of the loaf, and then I just poke it into a section and I'm looking for, I don't know what this is gonna read right now, but I'm looking for a minimum of 200 degrees before I take it out of the oven. I want 200 to 210. And um, this has already started to cool a little bit. There's a tiny bit of gumminess on my thermometer, but that means that it could have either risen more or baked a little more, but nobody's not gonna eat this bread, are they? Um, another way you can tell if the bread is done, the bread drum, you play it and see if it's um, ready and uh, sounds a little hollow, right? And those are, those are the main, the two main ways. Um, I know that uh, somebody had asked again about the, the temperature. I started it high. Uh, 550 degrees, dropped it down to 435. These instructions are all in the recipe that you're gonna get. Um, and let's move on to another question. So we also had a question about um, you shaping into your little mini loaves. Um, so you mentioned that it was just easier for you to handle, but was there anything else that contributed to that choice? No. Sometimes I'll do, I, you know, a bit, I guess it, it, I developed it because I tend to bake these gigantic loaves and I couldn't deal with that much dough. Um, mm -hmm. But I often, I do make it this size too. Um, my friend, Adrienne Hale taught me, the, she tamed me. I'm saying her name, Catherine, in case you recognize her. She's an Oregon baker and writer. And um, this is her recipe that, that I've taught tonight. And um, so you can, you can do it lots of ways, Hallie. I just went everywhere. <laughs> it's all good. We had another question about the flowers that you're using and the freshness of them. How right. long does it last? Can you just talk about like how you know they're fresh? How long do they last? Any signs and things around that? Yep, so in general, uh, fresh milled flour is three to six months. Three is three months for best use, six months for absolute. I mean, I've ne I buy it 25 pound bags at a time. And the only time I ever had any flour go bad was when I broke my pelvis and I couldn't bake. So it's, um, you can also control it by freezing. You know, so I, I put, when I get my 25 pound bags now, I, I put, 20 pounds in the freezer and bring it out five pounds at a time, which is about a week's worth. And that's, that's a really good way to do it. But the, the senses that you're looking for is this is fresh flour. Um, you can start to smell a little rancidity. These oils are going to go off. Um, you, that you can really taste it in a baked good when it's 
gone or taste it raw, but it's really about a timing thing. The bitterness that people affiliate with whole grain goods, that's from old flour. Mm -hmm. um, and that's because the bran and the germ that are in whole grain, whole wheat flours will go bad, even in a roller milled flour, not just stone milled. Um, so people might say, ooh, I don't like whole grain. That's because they haven't had fresh whole grain flour prepared in the proper way. So you've got a process you're, you're following, Mary Lee? Yeah, actually, I had bought, I don't know, 25, maybe 50 pounds of flour, and immediately, it was whole grain, um, whole wheat, I mean, and immediately put it into packages. This fits in the freezer. This is a five-pound package of flour, whole wheat, um, and five pounds equals 10 cups of flour. And there it is. Just freeze it, and, and it takes up very little space. It's surprising when it's flat like that. And so that's one way to go about it. And that's a gallon freezer bag, so it works. Yeah, yeah. It's nice, tidy math. There was a question about um, so the pans that you were showing in the beginning. You were kind of making like a bread hat. Yep. You want to talk through that? And I saw you might yeah. have been clipping. And then there was another question about whether you oil your pans. So I, I butter. I tend to butter my pans. Catherine, you can weigh in what you have people do because. When I use just olive oil on the pan, sometimes it's not quite enough. So I, I want the, the, uh, the solidity of the fat and I, I butter it every time. Um, and then I make this bread hat, it goes into the oven like that. And the idea behind that is to, you know, create an oven within an oven, um, the equivalent of those Dutch ovens. You don't have to glue it together. You could theoretically, use these two if you have two with a little bit of an edge they really sit nicely but this this sits nicely on top of this pan because it has a good edge on it and you just slide it in the oven together it's pretty simple was there another part of that question Hallie you're you're muted hun Sorry about that. No, I don't think we have any more. So I think most of the questions are about the sourdough starter. We see you, everyone. Thank you for dropping your names in the chat. We're excited that you're super excited. Um, you do have another question here from, from Doug. Um, is the bread hat there to hold moisture? So the whole reason you go for, it's, there's, a, there's a few reasons right there. It's to generate a little steam where you're, you're, you're having those starches gelatinize. It's also to concentrate the heat right around the dough. And if you concentrate the heat right around the dough, it's um, helping encourage the last burst of yeast activity that's gonna happen in this, this rise. So you're just gonna get a taller, a taller dough by having some way to trap it. It's, it's making the, um, the last burst of yeast activity hit its, its maximum promise. So that's how you get those big, beautiful rises on top, those loaves. Yeah. Well, thank you everyone for hanging around. I'm gonna turn it over to Bernie. Mm -hmm. um, and if I can mention one thing, um, just more about the starter, if you're not able to make it to Troy and you don't have a friend who has any, um, you certainly can buy dehydrated starter. I know King Arthur sells it. Um, there's probably other places. And if you do want to start your own, um, again, I think I, I find King Arthur's website a really great resource. Um, they have a very detailed blog instruction that, would, that walks you through how to start your own starter. It takes like five to seven days. So those are some other resources people can use. Thank you, Erin. Great tip. <clears throat> So that's great. So I think we're kind of getting to the tail end of things. Um, I think in listening to this session, actually the biggest secret probably is the relationship that you have with your starter and knowing all that is involved in getting it from, uh, from basically that the raw items all the way through to baking. I mean, everybody provided such interesting tips. Um, and it's all in just knowing your ingredients and knowing the process. Um, very, very interesting. So I guess that's really the other really big secret to this whole process. I hope that you all have been activated. 
um, <laughs> that hopefully you're all going to consider taking this passion and perhaps doing something good in your community. Um, and I do apologize, Ollie, I'm trying to get you off <laughs> spotlight. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, it's just been a really uh, good hour and almost a half here, it looks like. So thanks for hanging in. Um, and I guess the other thing is, if you have any questions and want to get involved with potentially donating any bread or getting something going, reach out to me. Um, I've got a list of uh, locations, at least in the Rensselaer County area, that we might be able to pursue. And I'd love to maybe work with others to get something going. So with that, look out for jerky next Tuesday, right? Um, we're hopefully going to get some messaging out on that very, very soon. But mark your calendar for Tuesday, a week from tonight at 7 o'clock. Different Zoom address, but basically the same place on your computer. Um, and with that, I guess I will just say thank you so much, everybody, for being with us. And have a really good rest of the evening. And I see that Mary Lee's doing a toast to the toast. We had talked okay. about it. Oh, <laughs> toast to everyone. <laughs> With maple syrup, the only way to go. Nice. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. We're so glad you came. Thanks, yeah. guys. Everyone. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>